There was a wonderful film in the 1970s called The Life of Brian. I don't know whether any of you are old enough to remember The Life of Brian, and perhaps I can ask, can anybody who remembers that film put their hand up for me? That's wonderful to see, nearly all of you. So part of the bequest, I was a student when that came out, or just after, and um, it's been handed down through the generations. And that film ends with one of the most extraordinary scenes in cinema, because the hero, Eric Idle, is in the early stages of crucifixion. And he kind of looks around philosophically, considering his predicament. And he starts to say, when you're chewing on life's gristle, don't grumble, give a whistle. And this will make things turn out for the right. And he continues into the song, always look on the bright side of life. And then he whistles. Thank you very much. You've passed the, uh, the screen test. You may be wondering by now why that's at all relevant to the subject of climate change. And I just want to ask you to hold one thought in your head about that scene. And it's this. At least Eric Idle knew that he was being ironic when he did that. At least he knew he was being ironic. I'm going to give you two illustrations of where we are on climate change at the moment. The first is from an official assessment that was carried out by the British government last year into the climate risk to the UK, the risk to the UK's strategic interests from climate change, and it includes this passage. Although the melting of the Arctic sea ice could have implications for the UK's climate and may damage the biodiversity of the Arctic, one potential positive outcome could be the opening of new shipping routes to Asia and the Pacific. These offer the potential for shorter journey times, lower fuel costs, and wait for it, savings in canal transit fees. The second illustration is from a dinner that I attended fairly recently, at which another guest was a very senior official, a very senior security official in a major NATO power. And the subject of discussion turned to the Arctic sea ice, and he was asked what did he think were the geopolitical implications of the melting of the Arctic ice. And he said, well, it's a pretty positive picture, actually, because if the ice melts, we can get more oil and gas out of the Arctic, and that'll push down energy prices, and it will make it harder for troublesome Gulf states to cause trouble. And the, the, the country, the name of Iran, was mentioned. And I think you can get the picture, because if you put those two stories together, what we seem to be saying, and it's not just the British government and security officials, we're saying it as societies as a whole, Climate change may be changing the Earth's geography on a scale which is unprecedented in human history. But hey, give a whistle. Because we can get out more of the oil and gas that have been causing the climate change in the first place. And what's more, we can ship it around more cheaply without paying transit fees to those pesky authorities in Suez and Panama. And so that's what I call the Eric Idle Gambit. Climate change may be the, the ruin of, of us, but let's, let's look on the bright side. I've been in the climate change business for about 15 years now, and I must say I do get a little bit angry in a, in a good-natured kind of way. Um, and what gets me angry isn't really the uh, Eric Idle thing. Um, uh, what makes me angry is that um, we can deal with climate change. We can deal with it but we aren't dealing with it. And if I'm angry, then you have a lot more to be angry about because you've got a lot more of your futures in front of you than I have of mine, and a lot more of the consequences of the climate decisions that my generation is taking. To fix climate change really isn't rocket science. There are really three things that we need to do, just three things. We need to take carbon emissions out of electricity and a few carbon-intensive industrial processes like cement making. So no coal or gas for electricity unless we bury the carbon emissions uh, using what's called carbon capture and storage. Um, second thing we need to do, we need to take oil and gas out of transport and heating. And the third thing we need to do is to make our economies much more energy efficient 
So we get what economists would call a multiplier on the demand side for our, for our decarbonization efforts. So that's a carbon neutral energy system in all the major economies roughly by the time that most of you get to my age. I'm 56. Um, and that's something we can do. We've got the technologies to do that. Some of them are already being deployed. Some of them are Victorian era technologies and others are close to deployment and we know what we need to do to accelerate it. Don't let anybody tell you that we can't afford to do it, actually. The, the major, the, certainly the industrialized economies and actually the major economies have the capital to do this. If we can bail out the banks, we can afford to bail out the banks, we can certainly afford to build a carbon neutral energy, energy system. And actually that's a pretty exciting prospect if you think about it. It's a story about electricity. It's using electricity to do more things in smarter ways, if you like, a new golden age of electrification. It will bring with it a makeover of our infrastructure, our power stations, our power grids, our transport infrastructure. Many of us live in societies with aging infrastructure that we complain about all the time. It will give a boost to the real economy, which has been rather dominated in recent years by casino finance. It'll get us back to creating real value in the real economy because it's about manufacturing, it's about engineering, it's about technology, it's about new supply chains. Um, uh, and it will also, in doing that, trigger a pulse, it already is triggering, triggering a pulse of low carbon innovation right across the economy because this is a whole economy issue. You can have or either have a high carbon whole economy or a low carbon whole economy. It'll make us less vulnerable to shocks in the oil price and the gas price. Um, and in the UK, here in the UK, it will perhaps rebalance the country by, by building up productive activity outside the rather favoured zone of the southeast and the home counties, of which Bedford is probably just about on the periphery. So we can do this. It's an exciting thing to do. Why aren't we doing it? What's going wrong? For a long time, I thought that the problem was what I call the three I's, ideology, interest, and intellectual shackles. Ideology because actually both on the left and on the right of established politics, none of the main political parties have really articulated what we need to do as a political choice. They're both inhibited. If you're on the right, you don't like the idea of intervening too much in the market and there's no non-interventionist way of doing it. If you're on the left, you're focusing on public services and entitlements and actually this requires a reform of public services in order to free up the resources uh, to drive it. Interests, because this is a process of quite dramatic change. It's a transformational process. And in any transformational process, in the early stages, the incumbency interests are bigger, stronger, more organized, wealthier, more powerful. Uh, and they try and slow down change because they're the incumbents. So that in this case, they fund a whole industry of climate change denial, uh, have funded it. Intellectual chains because actually since a generation ago, we have been rather in the grip of a, a theory about the way the economy should be run, which also allows little space for the kind of purposeful intervention called the neoliberal consensus, the kind of purposeful intervention that we need in order to drive this change. And these are, all of these three things are obstacles. But actually, the more I do this, the more it seems to me the real obstacles are a bit deeper. Um, uh, and there are three of them as well. Um, it's hard to mobilize across society if you don't have a clearly defined enemy. You know, in the Cold War, each side of the Cold War saw the other as an enemy, and that justified millions of individual choices. Secondly, the prevailing mood in many countries at the moment, certainly in this one, is not a mood of confidence. It's not a mood of, yes, we can, to use a phrase from American politics. It's a mood of anxiety because of what happened in 2008, because no growth seems to be in prospect, because we're in austerity, and because more deeply we feel in the grip of forces that we don't really understand and we can't control. And when the mood is anxiety, people hunker down. They look in, not out, and it's hard to do big things. And the third deepest reason of all is that politics really isn't working very well, and this is about politics before it's about anything else. We can only do it if we're offered an explicit political choice to do it. And what we've had is a collapse of confidence 
in mainstream politics. Many people think that politicians seem to be looking more, out of, more after themselves than the public interest. A collapse of confidence in public institutions, in the, the media, the police, the banking industry, big business generally. Politics is how we steer the ship. If politics isn't working, we can't steer the ship where we want it to go. So just to recap at this point, climate change is an existential threat. We know how to fix it. We actually claim that we're fixing it, but we're not fixing it really. And if we want it fixed, it is okay to be a little bit angry. But anger at the same time really isn't enough. And it's not enough because, as I said, this is a transformational process. And the system that we're trying to transform is the energy system. The energy system is at the heart of the economy. So we're trying to transform the economy. And at the heart of the economy is a whole set of power relationships that are embedded in the economy. And that system actually has some quite good antibodies for resisting change. It's got a lot of inertia built into it. And on the whole, that's a good thing. It's an excellent thing if you're not facing an existential threat. It's an excellent thing if institutions are working well and trusted by people to act in their interest. And it's an excellent thing if your politics is working. But the trouble is none of those conditions apply at the moment. Now, I imagine here in this rather well-appointed secondary school, there aren't many die-hard Leninists. I wonder, can anybody who's a die-hard die Leninist please put their hands up? Uh, I, won't, I think the headmaster's gone. I won't tell him if you... I can't, I can't see a single die-hard Leninist. Um, Lenin wrote a famous pamphlet, which was called What is to be Done? And that pamphlet was about how to channel anger into effective political action. Um, and actually, that's the right question. I'm not, I'm not about to kind of offer you a Leninist prospectus, but the question is right. And it's a hard question, not an easy one. And I have been in this business for 15 years. I really don't know what the answer is, except I do know that you and the generation that you represent, people who are under 30 today, you are a really important part of the answer to that question because you've got more of your future ahead of you, because you're not, as it were, complicit in the way that we've been running our societies, our economies, so far. Um, uh, and above all, because, and I don't know what, this is a place where many of you, I'm sure, are very politically educated and politically engaged, but I can tell you that as a whole, in Britain, in Europe, in North America, in large parts of East Asia, um, your generation has rather turned its back on politics. You've rather drawn the conclusion that politics isn't addressing the questions that are going to matter to you. So you've, as it were, gone into a kind of self-imposed uh, exile from the mainstream. You've left the public square, if you like. And really my core proposition tonight is, if you want to fix the climate, if you want to fix climate politics, then actually you've got to fix politics. Climate politics comes out of politics as a whole. And politics isn't right at the moment. You've heard that elsewhere tonight. Um, and if you want to fix politics, you have to bring in some new voices. Don't rely on the established voices because they will give you established solutions which are not solutions. And the most powerful new voice that can be brought into the picture, brought into the public square, is yours. So if we want to fix this problem of climate change, your voice is critical. And your voice can actually bring a new jolt of electricity into, into politics. I can't tell you how to use your voice. I have no permission, no author. I'm 56 years old. I can't tell people who are under 30 how to use. All I can do is encourage. I can share, and my generation can share the experiences that we have from the corridors of power, from the boardroom, from the negotiating chamber. Uh, and we can at least all make our experiences available. But the leadership, the ideas, the mobilization, if they don't come from your generation, they won't come at all. But with that health warning, I can at least offer perhaps a couple of suggestions. The first one is don't turn away from politics. Turn back to politics, engage with it, 
but do that in a way which is purposeful, which is strategic, which is organized on the basis that you as a generation have together, a conversation that you have together, together about the kind of future that you want to experience. The second suggestion is, is this. You've all heard of the Occupy movement. Maybe some of you were camped outside St. Paul's Cathedral in Paternoster Square. I don't know. But the Occupy movement was pretty significant, I think. Historians will look back and say it was significant, but not for what it was and what it is. It was significant for where it points to, the next stage. And that's my second suggestion. It's this. Don't occupy, or at least don't just occupy vacant spaces, public squares, empty buildings. Take your place in crowded spaces and make your voice heard in those spaces. Join political parties, but join them on your own terms. Join government departments, join companies, NGOs, faith groups, local authorities, but join them on your own terms and do it in a purposeful, strategic, organized way based on a conversation that you're having with each other about the kind of future you want to build. And don't let anybody say to you, you have no right to make your voice heard. You have no authority to do that. It seems to me that anybody who says that, it's like saying in the US to Gabrielle Giffords, the congresswoman who was shot, tragically. It's like saying to her that she has no right to express a view on gun control, which is what the National Rifle Association, I think, did say to her, absurdly. Um, third suggestion, don't let the question, as you join, as you join all of those crowded rooms, enter those crowded rooms, don't let the question be, what can we do to avoid too much change? Demand that the question be, who can we be to make possible the changes that we need so that our future becomes as attractive as the future looked when you were our age, when people like me were your age. Because I think there's no more salient political fact in the world today than the fact that in many societies, your generation is looking at the future and saying, actually, it's not as attractive as it looked to our parents when they were our age. That's an extraordinary, that's an extraordinary thing. There are really two attitudes anybody can have towards the future. You can see the future as something that's going to happen to you. You can kind of lay back and let it flow over you, but if what happens to you isn't what you like, don't then blame anybody for how it turned out. Or you can say the future is going to be what we build. And I don't care, I really don't care what any of you think about climate change specifically. I don't care what you think about nuclear power, about solar panels, about emissions trading. I don't particularly care what you think about the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, or the Liberal Democrats here in the UK, about the Democrats and Republicans in the US, about Congress or the BJP in India, about the Chinese Communist Party. That's not the heart of the matter. What I care about is what you think about the future and whether you have made that choice, each of you as individuals, that you want it to be a future that you build, that you participate in building together. Because if you do that, then that will give us a shot of building a future where climate change is at least a manageable problem. It doesn't take us over unmanageable thresholds, food insecurity, water insecurity, energy security. And if you don't do that, then we can't. And just to finish, when I was a small, I just vaguely remember being a very small child in the 1950s, and Britain was recovering still from war. I remember the bomb sites. Cities had been battered. Families had been battered. People had been battered. We were much poorer then as a society than we, than we are now. But my parents' generation, they did choose to build their future, and they built power stations, freeways, power grids. They built a country. And some of that cost money, but they saw it as a worthwhile investment, poorer than we are, as, than we are now as they were then. You're going to get, each one of you, the inheritance that my generation leaves you. And you can wait for it. You can sit back and let it happen to you, and you'll get what you get. 
Or you can say, I want my inheritance now, or at least I want to claim my part in shaping that inheritance. If my parents could do that in a war-ravaged Britain of the 1950s, then you can do that, we can do it together in a much wealthier Britain and a much wealthier world, actually, of the 2010s and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you.